Good morning, everyone. Whoa, that sounds good. Uh, I uh, appreciate you praying for me last week as I uh, was battling uh, shingles, and uh, I heard all the jokes. I heard Mark said he wanted to start a shingles ministry, and uh, someone told me my roof will not leak anymore because I have new shingles, so I've heard them all, but uh, it is, uh, I, uh, I, I have to tell you, I I really wanted to be here and uh, and to see everybody and to see the back of your heads from the from the video, from the from the camera. I was like, "Well, there's so and so," and it seemed like there were a lot more people there last week than there had been in a long time. And I'm like, "How did the word get out so quickly that I wasn't going to be here?" <laughs> Yesterday was a good day. It was a great day, and uh, I pray that um, that you'll be able to take advantage of it uh, uh, next year. We ask the Lord for a lot of things, and uh, we expect God. We look forward to God's answer uh, in His timing, which is which is always perfect. So this entire month, uh, we are going to be. Uh, uh, studying from the scriptures on prayer, and um, I, uh, I I really wanted to preach last week's sermon, and I didn't get to, and so this week today I'm going to preach two sermons. If that's okay with you, no, it's not okay with you. No, no, it's not okay with you. Um, so if you got your Bibles, if you will open to Matthew chapters 26. We're going, to be a look, we're going to be looking at a passage on uh, prayer of Jesus. But I want to read this to you. And in an article in the Wall Street Journal, columnist Elizabeth Bernstein has written about the benefits of prayer. On the, the onset of the coronavirus pandemic has increased worldwide interest in prayer. Google searches for prayer has skyrocketed. She interviewed numerous people who have turned to prayer to handle the anxiety and fear. Some researchers say their studies on prayer show it can calm your nerves, uh, your nervous system, shutting down your fight or flight response. It can make you less reactive to negative emotions and less angry. Other research has shown that the most effective prayer results come from those who view God in a positive light and themselves as a co-laborer with God. That was an article from the Wall Street Journal. I remember right after 9-11, churches were filled with people who felt the need to pray. Sadly, though, it would not last, and soon... They were back to relying on themselves. Some people honestly believe prayer works, while others pray as an insurance, just in case it works. Some don't pray at all. They don't believe in it. To them, praying to a God who doesn't exist is futile. I've heard stories of many atheists who once believed in God, but because he did not answer their prayer in the way that they wanted him to, they concluded that God didn't exist. The title of today's message is, Why Won't You Answer? And I want to explore that question through Scripture. So that our conclusion is not to deny God's existence, but to find Him even in His silence. We're going to look today at one of Jesus' most intimate prayers to the Father. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 36. Jesus had just 
finished his upper room discourse. Judas was outed as the betrayer, and he hurried off to seal the deal with the religious leaders. And now Jesus and his disciples go out to pray. Verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means it's, it's, uh, it's two words put together. On one word is a wine press and the other word for oil. And so it was a place, it was an olive garden, and it was where they would press the olives to make, him, make it into oil. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. We know from the Gospels, from the other Gospels, and particularly in Luke, that Jesus frequented this place. It was a place where he went often to pray. Judas certainly knew where it was, where he led the temple guards right to him. Must have been a quiet place. Must have been a, a peaceful place to pray. Although we know that on that night, it was anything but peaceful. That leads me to ask you this question. Do you have a place you like to frequent for prayer? Away from the busyness of life. Away from your routines and certainly away from your smartphone. Any other distraction, social media. I hope you have a place like that. I hope you have a place where you can go to away from your routines where you and God have a conversation. You know, interestingly, uh, it, in Jerusalem, they didn't allow gardens inside the walls. You were not allowed to have gardens inside the walls because the manure, the fertilizer that you would have to use to grow the plants and the trees were considered to be unclean. So you had to go outside the walls if you wanted to enjoy a garden. And this garden was outside the eastern gate down the Kidron Valley and back up the other side was this garden verse 37 now and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee we know that this is James and John he began to be sorrowful and trouble it says these three were the inner circle do you have an inner circle it's not a bad thing. It's just, it means your closest friends, the people that you normally and usually confide in, the people that you know that they have your back and you have theirs. Well, this was the inner circle. These are the three, Peter, James, and John. They had the privilege of being present with Jesus on other occasions where the other disciples were not. The, the Mount of Transfiguration, the three were there. The healing of Peter's mother, they were there. Healing the daughter of the synagogue ruler, the three were there. And only these three are mentioned in the book of Acts. Supposedly, they were the cream of the crop of Jesus' disciples. So it's even more shocking that when Jesus told him to stay and keep watch, within an hour they fell asleep. It says he began to be sorrowful and distressed. This word for sorrow is grieving to the point of pain. It is a very intense pain. And it's, this word is even used to describe the pain of childbirth. Most of us, well, all of us men, we don't know anything about that. 
We can only witness that, but we can't experience that. But it's that kind of pain that Jesus suffering. So we see in verse 38, then, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Then he says, remain here and watch with me. The word for watch there is keep watch, stay alert, be on your guard. He confides in these three, this three inner circle companions, and he says, my soul is very sorrowful. Now, this is similar to the word in verse 37, but this one is even more intense. It's a compound word from peri and lupe. Peri means it's where we get the word perimeter. It's an encompassing word. It means surrounded. What Jesus is saying is that he's saying that grief in every direction. That he has nowhere to turn to. He is surrounded with sorrow, even to the point of death. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe some of you have felt that in your life. This is when you feel like all of life has been sucked out of you. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe it was some catastrophic news. Maybe it was a test result from the doctor. A call from a a loved one. It's as though life stands still. And you're at a loss as to what to do. You know, I pulled up some pictures from the Internet. Have you ever seen pictures of Jesus praying in the garden? I want to show you some pictures there. There there they are. There's just three of them there. It's usually trying to capture this very scene right here in this passage where Jesus is praying in the garden. The garden. We are so used to the sanitized version of this passage. I mean, he's squeaky clean. He's looking up and he's praying. And it looks peaceful. But the reality was that there was great agony there was great sorrow and grief over what Jesus was about to encounter for us and if it was anything but peaceful it was anything but tranquil remain here and keep watch with me he says it means to keep watch to stay vigilant It literally means to stay awake, and yet they fall asleep. Then verse 39, and going a little further, he fell on his face. This means prostrate. The picture is he is on his knees and he's looking up. But in reality, he fell prostrate with his face in the ground, in the dirt, prayed, saying, Father, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This word cup, it was a term in biblical terms meant the destiny of man or or the judgment of man. And Jesus' destiny, the reason he came to earth was to become the sacrificial lamb for the sins of all men. And he was about to be judged for the sins of all men. He knew this. Yet he was asking the Father if there was another way. 
What do you think Jesus was afraid of? Was he afraid of dying? His followers, not many years later, they would be murdered and martyred and die an excruciating death. They were violently killed. What drove him to such agony that Luke records that he he sweat drops of blood? Was he afraid of physical pain? No. So what was the reason? Why was Jesus in such agony? I believe the reason Jesus was terrified to the point of death was because he knew that the cup meant this cup that he was about to partake meant that he was to experience the judgment of sin and that that judgment was separation from the father just think about this we know that jesus was all god And yet he was all men. Don't ask me to explain that to you. That that I I I I don't have enough education to explain that to you. But somehow he was all God, and yet he was all man. Scripture says he limited himself. He felt everything that you and I feel. He was tempted in all ways and yet without sin. So he was all God and he was all man, but I want you and I to focus for a moment for for right now on the humanity of Jesus. He is all man. He has known the Father entire, his entire ministry life, his life on earth. The Father publicly affirmed him twice. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He had prayed to him. He spent time with him early in the morning and late at night. He would spend time with with the Father, but now this last mile, this last act, this final step, this final step as a man, as our intercessor, as first John two tells us, as our sin bearer, he would have to experience lostness he would have to experience separation from the father he's going to be cut off from god you ever wonder why jesus when he was hanging on the cross he didn't cry out father father why have you forsaken me He cried out, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God. In that moment, he was separated. And he knew that that was what was going to take place. And that's what brought him sorrow. That's what grieved him. And that's what sucked the life out of him. You know, as a young Christian, I always thought that Jesus being God, that he could have just rendered that pain null and void. That the the beating that he went through and and all that he went through for you and me, that he could just he could just 
expel that and not, and not feel it. But he was all man. And the struggle that he went through for you and me was real. It, it's, it's not a movie. It's not, it's not just a story. It's the reality that Jesus went through this pain for you and me. But we focus on the physical pain that Jesus went through. When you watch these movies, The Passion of the Christ, and you read the Scriptures, we focus on the physical pain. But the reality is what, what brought sorrow to Jesus was the fact that he was separated from the Father. And three times in this passage, three times he asked the Father, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. This was the final temptation. As a man, Jesus, as a man, could he go through with it? He's asking the Father to let this cup pass because he didn't know if he could go through with it, but he knew that he had to go through with it. So if you think it was easy for him because he was God, you're you're sadly mistaken. But here I want to get to where Jesus adds something to his prayer that we often neglect in our prayer. He says this. He says, if, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Other translations may say, not my will be done, but your will be done. We don't pray those kind of prayers. We pray, Lord, this is what I need. Lord, I'm counting on you to come through. Lord, I know what I want and I need you to make it happen. Lord, let me prosper. Let me flourish. Keep me safe. Keep me secure. But Jesus says, not my will, but as you will. Think about this. This is the complete opposite of what Adam said with his actions. Adam said in his human nature, in his flesh nature, Adam said, not your will, God, but my will be done. Stop and think about it. That is the root. That, that, is, that is where sin begins, is that we don't want to do God's will. We want to do our will. So he says, not your will, God, but my will be done. And then Jesus, the second Adam, he comes to right the wrongs of the first Adam. And Jesus says, not my will, Father, but your will be done. You know, I think that most often, most often, when God doesn't answer prayers, it's because... We're asking for our will and not his will. Jesus' human nature cries out for deliverance. He, he's all human and he's saying, Father, deliver me from this. But his heart is set on fulfilling the will of the Father. Now here's a challenge for you and me. 
do you know that just as Jesus was sent to fulfill his purpose, you and I, we have a purpose to fulfill. And it comes straight from the top. It doesn't come from some book. It doesn't come from some preacher. It doesn't come from some religious organization or denomination. It comes straight from the top. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take the Word's word for it. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 20, verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21 says, it says this, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. So here's my final question. Are you like the first Adam or are you like the second Adam? Are you fulfilling your will or are you fulfilling his will? Let me encourage you to make it a habit in your prayer to pray like Jesus prayed. Not my will, but yours be done. Lord, I want you to bring healing. We ask you to bring healing. Nevertheless, we want your will and not our will. Realizing that sometimes God's glory is shown in the suffering and not in the deliverance. And you and I, as followers of Jesus, we must be willing to allow God and His will to triumph and not ours. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this example of Jesus' prayer and how he prayed for your will and not his own. Thank you, Lord, that he gives us an example of fulfilling a purpose to which he was called. And Lord, thank you that likewise, every person in this room has been called to a purpose. I pray, Lord, that it would be our determination, our commitment, our life's goal to fulfill that purpose. Thank you, Lord, that you called us. You called us out of a life of sin, and death, and destruction. And you called us to a life that is not based on circumstances, but a life that's in spite of circumstances. That our peace and our joy and our love and our security does not come from what we encounter, but it comes directly from you, the one who sends us. Give us courage, Lord. Give us courage to live in our circumstances. And even as we ask for deliverance, that we would be courageous in praying for your will to be done and not our will. Lord, we confess where when we have in the past, where we have insisted on and even demanded at times our will that we wanted things the way we wanted them lord we repent of that we we confess where we are wrong and we ask you lord to lead us to a life where your will is priority and your will is triumph we pray this 
the name of Jesus. Amen.